Visa is granting Coinbase the power to issue Bitcoin debit cards. Oh my gosh. Is this a hallelujah, guys, or what? Visa is granting Coinbase the power to issue Bitcoin debit cards. Amazing, guys. On another news bit, Elon Musk is going to be giving us the future of the internet. In the last news bit for today, TikTok's new competitor, Byte, is giving opportunities to content creators. Content creators, guys. They're giving them incentives. This and more in Venture Daily. I figured we might as well jump right into it, guys. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the show. It is Venture Daily, after all. Welcome, everybody. It's your Monday. That's right. It's Monday. And welcome to the party. Uh, I heard the, the, the guy uh, who created Welcome to the Party. It's a great song. Uh, recently died, the rapper. I don't know much about him. But uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful Monday. All you founders, the tech curious, the entree pro curious out there. Let's get into the show today. I'm going to be changing things up. We're going to be removing venture deals, and we're just going to be covering three news bits and then a brief word from me today, guys. I hope you're ready. Let's get into it. Something I'm pretty excited here is that v Visa grants a Coinbase the power to issue Bitcoin. That's right, Bitcoin debit cards. I've talked about this for a long time, my friends. I told you that eventually that the Bitcoin, the, the world of banking, the world of banking and credit cards, they're going to accept Bitcoin, that busy to beat after all. You know what's going to happen. Credit card giant Visa has granted its principal membership to a cryptocurrency company for the first time. Officially awarded to cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase in December, but not revealed to the public until today, the membership cuts out a crucial and expensive middleman from the process of issuing a debit card that lets users spend their own busy Bitcoin, Ether, or XRP anywhere Visa is accepted. For all you XRP, uh, the army out there, hey, as long as you hodl and you stay strong, you know what? Companies are going to come around. Perhaps even more importantly, though, the principal membership makes Coinbase the first cryptocurrency company with the power to issue debit cards for others, including other cryptocurrency companies and more traditional firms alike. Visa confirmed it granted Coinbase the principal membership, clarifying that the company itself won't actually accept cryptocurrency when the project goes live later this year. Now, what this could mean is that Coinbase can now issue debit cards, Bitcoin debit cards, to other cryptocurrency companies. And there's a lot of cryptocurrency companies out there that are trying to do this. So the question is, is this going to remove competition from other coins, other cryptocurrency projects that are focused on debit cards and Bitcoin? Hmm. Is Coinbase going to be the evil eye of Sauron that's going to take over the cryptocurrency landscape? I told you guys many times, Brian Armstrong, Coinbase, they're getting their ish together, guys. While Coinbase says it's not planning on issuing cards to others anytime soon, the principal membership status marks a potentially important new revenue stream for the company, which Forbes estimates saw a 40% decline in earnings last year. By simplifying the process of spending cryptocurrency anywhere Visa is accepted, the membership also lays the foundation for a potential explosion of that busy Bitcoin, Ether, XRP, and more as a way to buy everyday items, regardless of whether the merchant accepts cryptocurrency itself. You don't have to accept cryptocurrency. You can still take a Bitcoin debit card. Amazing. Your Bitcoin's hodlings have never been liquid because you have to sell them. You have to go through a process, withdraw the money, and then spend it. It's never been instant. Oh, I'll buy this cup of coffee with Bitcoin, says Jishan Faroz, CEO of Coinbase UK, which received the membership. Quote, what the card is trying to change is the mindset that crypto is tucked away, takes two days to access, and can actually now be spent in real time. Now, you guys know that I've proven over and over and over again that you can spend that busy Bitcoin. I bought 
a Lamborghini in 2017 with that BSV Bitcoin. Not a problem. But this means that even the whole, the whole meme, the whole idea, the meme of you can't buy coffee with Bitcoin, looks like, guys, we're finally getting to that point. You can buy coffee with crypto. Managed by Coinbase, a fully owned UK subsidiary based in London with offices in Dublin, the card that automates the conversion of cryptocurrency into whatever currency the merchant accepts will be available in 29 countries when it's first issued later this year, including Denmark, Estonia, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, and the UK. But that means that you Americans, us people over here in America, can't get it yet, guys. It's okay. We're still progressing slowly. The Coinbase Visa debit card will not be available to U.S. residents. Further simplifying the process of actually spending cryptocurrency, the nine cryptocurrencies available on the card also including Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Braves BAT, Augur's Rep, Xerox, ZRX, and Stellar's Lumen won't likely be subject to unwieldy capital gains taxes at the point of sale. Unlike the US and EU, it doesn't require spenders to pay additional tax on the difference in price based on the cryptocurrency was purchased and when it was spent. Farah says direct access to the Visa network gives the cryptocurrency exchange more flexible flexibility in the business models it pursues. A previous Coinbase Visa card was issued in April 2019 by financial services firm Paysafe Hodlings Group Limited, which vets its customers, including corporate spending firm Soldo and mobile banking app Lunar, and charges a fee for the service. And by the way, some of you might remember I actually covered this back in the day. You have a dependency on the risk appetite and the models they'd like to work with, says Faraz. Direct membership allows us to take control of our issuing program. Hmm, control, I see. While fees merchants traditionally pay to their banks to accept credit cards and debit cards will remain the same as with any other cards, Coinbase's own fees could eventually be reduced as a result of the membership. Through, though Faraz declined to share the exact amount Coinbase paid to pay safe to issue the cards, signing a non-disclosure agreement. The removal of that cost is expected to eventually result in reduced fees to the end user. Guys, I know, I know, I know. We, we, the larger our organization gets, even if it's a cryptocurrency organization, we tend to take pause. Because we don't, you know, there's this whole idea of we don't want too much centralization. But at the end of the day, you know what? These companies are growing. They're booming. And they're giving us options as consumers. This, this is powerful. I'm like super, super excited. This is going to make Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and all those other coins that's in there. Zero X, Stellar Lumens, right? Augur, uh, XRP, Ether. What happened to Litecoin though? What happened to Litecoin though? Charlie Lee, what's going on? John Kim, what's going on, man? What's going on? Currently, Coinbase charges 2.49% fee on domestic transactions, regardless of the value, in addition to other potential charges. If those fees are reduced as a result of membership, existing card owners would need reapply for a new card issued directly by Coinbase in order to benefit. If you already got one of those cards, it's time to reapply and get a new one, guys. A direct membership gives us more cost efficiency, says Faraz. And ultimately, as we scale the program, the goal is to pass those cost efficiencies to our customers. Faraz says that the UK is Coinbase's largest and most active debit card market based on usage patterns from the earlier card, followed by Italy, Spain, and France, with almost half of the card owners being active users, making purchases ranging from many thousands of euros for large ticket items to a few pounds for a coffee, he says, adding, quote, we're seeing quite an even spread. Historically, revenue for cryptocurrency exchanges like Coinbase have been directly tied to the price of cryptocurrency, with fees charged in fiat currency increasing when the price is high and decreasing when it drops. For example, Coinbase itself saw revenue decline, an estimated 40% last year, from a reported $1.3 billion in 2018. When revenue included Bitcoin's monumental price increase the previous year to what Forbes believes will be an $800 million this year. 
Frost acknowledged that the fees charged to companies outside the cryptocurrency space could eventually become a new source of revenue, less dependent on cryptocurrency price fluctuations, adding, however, that isn't currently a part of the plan. Our primary focus is to build our own service, he says. To give an idea of how much is on the table here, the credit card issuing industry last year generated $107 billion. That's right, billion, my friends. Billion and $24 billion profit charging these fees and others to co companies like Coinbase, according to a report by research firm Ibis World. In addition to PaySafe's past work with Coinbase, the Metropolitan Commercial Bank currently issues a Visa card for Bitcoin firms BitPay and Crypto.com, while European e-money firm Depocket Limited issues cryptocurrency lender Nexo's MasterCard. Our work with fintechs such as Coinbase includes helping them and issuance and giving them access to APIs so they can build new products on our network, said Terry Anglos. Visa's global head of fintech in a statement to Forbes. For example, in addition to being able to issue credit cards, Coinbase status as a principal member of Visa gives it access to Visa Direct, a payouts mechanism that already gives users of Square, Venmo, and Zelle the option to receive payment instantly for a fee, similar to a traditional wire transfer, instead of waiting three business days using the traditional ACH payment rails. Being a principal member of Visa actually extends beyond just issuing cars, said Faraz. This is, this is right here, guys. Powerful, 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 powerful. I think this is a huge win for the cryptocurrency landscape. And you guys have heard me talk multiple times about the value of large organizations doing all the heavy lifting, like Coinbase, like the New York Stock Exchange, like the big institution, institutional banks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even Facebook as well. You guys have heard me talk about Facebook and the Libra coin. And I got a lot of flack from people telling me that, hey, your opinion about you know Facebook being good for crypto is invalid. Eh. I still disagree. I think that these large companies like Visa, Coinbase, your Facebooks, your MasterCards, right, your big banks, they're going to do all the heavy lifting. And the reason is quite simple. And this is something I was talking about, guys. This is something that I was talking about years ago, years ago on the old channel that used to be this channel, Bite Size Bitcoin. I talked about this, that the more that Bitcoin continues to expand, inevitably, inevitably companies are going to come in line because at the end of the day you can't get rid of bitcoin you can't get rid of cryptocurrency and so there's going to become a day for all of these companies to finally pay the fiddler pay the man get in line and realize that if you want to survive in the future if you want to be relevant in the future as a banking company or a financial company you're going to have to create a strategy for accepting cryptocurrency. It just is what it is. And now we're seeing the big boys, the big boys like Visa, working with Coinbase to issue debit cards. And these debit cards could be cheaper for us users and not have to worry about price fluctuations in the market. This is a big deal. I don't know why more people aren't trumpeting this as a, as a, as a, maybe I'm just completely biased and I'm just completely all over the place. And maybe, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but guys, I think I know what I'm talking about. I've been in this game a long time. So let me know your comments below. If you believe that this is a great move for cryptocurrency and Visa and Coinbase, Brian Armstrong, I see you. I know you still made fun of me with my Bitcoin Lambo, but you know what? I'm going to give you some respect here. Good on you. Good on you, Brian Armstrong. Let's move on. Elon Musk says he's about to deliver the future of high-speed internet. Elon Musk has been saying for years that he believes the future of the internet resides in space. Kind of like um, my conversation with Tim Draper, hashtag Bitcoin in space. He's now planning to make a major change that could facilitate the transition sooner rather than later. In a move that sent a, could send shockwaves throughout the internet space, SpaceX is planning to spin out its Starlink satellite-based internet service into its own entity. It will also make Starlink public, allowing investors to get a piece of what Musk believes is the future of internet connectivity. 
Right now, we are a private company, but Starlink is the right kind of business that we can go ahead and take public, Gwen Shotwell, SpaceX chief operating officer, said on Thursday, according to Bloomberg. That particular piece is an element of the business and that we are likely to spin out and go public. Starlink is SpaceX name for a satellite based internet service. The company envisions sending thousands of satellites into space that can beam internet access back to the ground. Those satellites will come together in a cluster over highly populated areas to ensure delivery and enough coverage, as well as be able to send a laser beam straight down to your house and explode you. <laughs> no, I just added that, guys. They also, they'll also beam internet to less populated parts of the world where people still aren't online. So far, SpaceX has shipped 240 Starlink satellites into space and plans to deliver many thousand more in the coming years. Musk has already tested the device, but is not currently available to the public. The real question is, are satellites real? To all you conspiracy buffs out there, are satellites real? Nope. I don't know. On Thursday, Shotwell didn't provide specifics, but did say that the service will be substantially cheaper than what existing internet access costs and will give and will deliver speeds that are five, ten times faster than what you get now, potentially putting it in the same game-changing class as 5G. Hmm. Hmm. 5G or satellite internet? I think I'll go with the satellite internet, guys. Shotwell didn't say when Starlink would go public, but all signs are pointing to sooner rather than later, and that makes sense. As part of SpaceX, Starlink is just a component in a broader business, and while it gets attention at SpaceX, it's not the company's main focus. By spinning it off, SpaceX can have a company in Starlink that's so focused solely on building an internet service in space, and perhaps most importantly, it could help expedite the process of upgrades that could take years to develop terrestrially. For investors, it also means an opportunity to have a stake in SpaceX, the company that has remained private since its inception. As recent Tesla gains have proved, how many of you guys have made money on that? On that, have proved there's money to be made on Elon Musk's companies. And with Starlink's help, investors might be able to do it again. Better yet for Starlink, it's an opportunity to raise much needed cash. Still, plenty of questions surrounding Starlink and SpaceX abound, and there's no guarantee that the company will actually go public. But look for more to come on that front, and for satellites to be beaming internet to your house sooner rather than later. Wow. Bitcoin in space, says Tim Draper. He says that in the future, Bitcoin is going to be in space, and frankly, the, the world nations are going to want to take a chunk, I guess, out of the free open space out there so they can, you know, make profits and stuff. When it comes to 5G, I have found that there is conflicting uh, evidence that 5G is good for us and that 5G is bad for us. But I will generally say that whenever the government pushes something pretty heavily, it's generally going to be bad for us. So the question you have to ask yourself, is the government pushing 5G pretty heavily? If they are, then maybe it's bad for us. And therefore, I would default, considering the context of this article, I would probably default to getting internet from Elon. What say you? Let us know in the comments below. Now, you guys know that I'm all about that tiktok -aroos. Well, TikTok's new rival is making itself out by offering incentives for content creators. I haven't, I've checked it out. I didn't like the app so far. So this whole, this whole new app called Byte, mm, let me know in the comments below if you're already using Byte. So Byte already stood out from a crowd of TikTok competitors by vowing that a majority of its revenue it generates will go to content creators, a lure that its bigger rival has yet to offer. Byte, created by Vine co-founder Dom Hoffman, has announced a program to reward content creators based on viewer figures. During an unspecified pilot period, 100% of ad revenue will go to creators, while the long-term plan is to have the majority of the revenue going to creators. It said in a statement on its website. This model will distinguish the app from TikTok, the global short video hit owned by Beijing-based ByteDance, and will likely drive higher content quality. After several years, TikTok still doesn't offer any official way for its users to monetize their posted videos, said Katie Williams, mobile insight strategist and analytics firm Sensor Tower. 
Creators can earn revenue by being on TikTok, but that comes from branded or sponsored content, deals that users must negotiate themselves without TikTok's assistance, or to a lesser extent, through tipping on live streams. Receiving direct compensation based on viewing figures seems like a lot more inviting and doable, she said. TikTok did not immediately respond to a request for comment on its compensation strategy. Byte launched a little over a week ago, reboots the old Vine video sharing service, which Hoffman co-founded in the summer of 2012 and later sold to tweeters that year. It obtained more than 1.3 million downloads from both iOS and Google Play during the first week of release, according to Sensor Tower. About 70% of the new installs came from the US, followed by the UK and Canada with 7 and 6% respectively. Well, when it comes to Byte, how do the pay how do the creators get paid and is the reward system only the first? Byte has been running running a start do start do to its connection to Vine, but that is not the only trait the app will need to succeed in the already saturated market of short form video platforms said Williams. Twitter failed to make Vine profitable and eventually discontinued it in 2016. TikTok overtook Facebook to become the second most downloaded app worldwide in 2019 behind, that's right, itself, prompting platforms such as Instagram to make bigger efforts with short form content. TikTok owner ByteDance bought Musical.ly, a US app especially popular with teenagers in 2017, and the acquisition had helped drive its overseas expansion. TikTok's growth has brought a fresh regulatory and privacy problems, including in the US. The company has repeatedly said that it stores TikTok user information outside China and has made ef extra efforts to safeguard minors. Hmm, I don't know about that. Most of the stuff that I see on TikTok when I'm scrolling is just booties. Oliver Reaches, a 21-year-old from Isle of Wight in the UK, is on both platforms. He says it's easier to gain traffic on TikTok as it is bigger, but Byte is cleaner and smoother and has tight-knit and supportive community. He expects Byte to grow big because of the nostalgia attached to the vine and also because of its smoother loops and fewer adverts, he said. He signed up for Byte's creator reward program, which has not yet started for British users. Byte creators have in mind rather have in mind rather than going to pure profit, basically, and that's completely different to any other app, he said. This is what will drive people to the app. Well, you guys know that I'm on the hunt, always, for the latest pieces of technology, especially in the social world. You guys, I've, I think I've just crossed 8,000 subscribers on... Um, no, maybe not. Maybe I'm still under 8,000 subscribers on my TikTok. And I've been seeing it grow steadily. I still don't quite understand the algorithm. And I did download Byte, but Byte just seemed really lame. So I wonder, let me know out there, all you internet Netsians and all my internet friends, let me know. What are your thoughts on Byte versus TikTok? To be quite frank, I will say that probably I won't receive a whole lot from any of you guys. And the reason is, is because most of you guys don't last this long in the video, number one. And number two, many of you guys don't use social that much. Or maybe I'm wrong. But let me know. I think it's important for any type of entrepreneur, any type of founder out there to be on all the social media platforms. Why is this true? Because you never know where your customers are going to come from. And if you're building something for consumers, let's be intellectually honest, your future consumers are all 9, 10, 11, and 12 right now. You probably, well, you probably want to make sure that you're on their radar. Did you know that there's even more value than just audio or video? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, at VC Hunting. And make sure to sign up for the VC Hunting newsletter, where you'll be able to get weekly news on venture capital, startups, founder stories, and the occasional wisdom extracted from Peter's brain. Go to vchunting.com to sign up. And now, back to the episode. And now for a special word from me. Guys, I love being a part of your day. I love doing this and I know and I know that everything that I'm doing here and I want this to be an encouragement for you guys today especially if you're a founder out there or you're the entree pro curious or you're an inv individual trying to grow themselves in some way one of the things that I've been meditating on a lot this year is the whole idea of a decade so much happens in a decade 
So much happens. Did you, did you guys remember my review of my decade in review back in Jan, early January? If you haven't seen that, make sure that you check it out. It's amazing what I've been able to accomplish in the last 10 years. And it gives me a fresh perspective that you know what, in the next 10 years, amazing things are going to happen as well. The thing that I've been meditating on this on, on a lot, however, is this idea, this tension that I, I, I struggle with. You see, I am always struggling. And maybe you guys could resonate with me out there, but I'm always struggling with the tension of doing enough and not doing enough. Let me explain. As a founder, as a, a, an individual, an entrepreneur, I don't have a boss. I don't have someone that I need to go into an office and sit at a desk and say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, right? As an entrepreneur, as a founder, it is incumbent on me to move the ball forward every day in my quest. And what is my quest? Let me remind you, I'm looking forward to building a venture capital fund, a venture firm, so that I can deploy capital into great startups and great founders and great entrepreneurs. I love being able to give that way. And frankly, I've never built a venture fund before. Yeah, 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 for the last decade plus, I've been on the other side of venture capital asking for money for my projects, and I understand it pretty well. But let's be intellectually honest, I've actually never built a venture capital fund before. I have a really unique thesis, and the thesis is around community and focusing on community building tools community apps, founders with community, or people that are, or founders with the three Ps. They have to have personality, a plan, and perseverance. And so this is what I want to build in the future. Now I know that I'm not going to be able to build a venture capital fund overnight. It's just not going to happen. There's a due process to this. And frankly, I have to be in a beginning beginner mindset and constantly learn about venture capital so I can make better informed decisions as I grow my business. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing VC hunting. One of the best ways to learn is to interview those who have gone before you. But I'm always struggling, guys. I'm always struggling with this idea of doing enough and not doing enough. You see, you, there's always, I will, I, will, I will be intellectually honest and tell you that there's always more to be done. There's always more to be done. I can knock out a piece of content, do the news, go after, after this, go upstairs, start knocking out some chapters on my book. Then later this afternoon, I'm going to do an interview for VC Hunting. Then I'm going to go through the eight hour, in, eight hour uh, a post-processing machine to create the to create the, the video, to create the podcast, create the, the Twitter story, to create the Instagram, to create the TikTok video. Like, there's a lot of work that goes into this, and I'm going to have a full day today for sure. But I'm always wrestling with the, I'm not doing enough. Because there are hours in a day which I have a little bit of downtime, and I could be doing work. And the whole idea of, yes. So I always feel like there's a tension between not doing enough. And I want to remind you guys out there, and I want to remind myself mostly, that we have a decade to go. Yeah, man, I just have to remember that. I just have to remember that in the last 10 years, I've accomplished so much. I've achieved so much. And it was a day by day by day, intentionally moving towards my goal. I remember telling, um, I think it was the two beans in the pod, uh, two, two sexy beans in the pod on, that, on their podcast. I remember telling them, they, they asked me, what is success? And I told them, I said very clearly, success is really easy. Success is simple. It's the progressive realization of a worthy goal. It's a progressive realization of a noble goal. It's taking one step in front of the other and moving towards purpose, intention-filled purpose or some goal. And so I have to remind myself, and I hope this is helpful to you guys out there. I have to remind myself that it's okay to not do everything every day. It's okay to just get in the 1%. Some days, the only thing that I can, I can muster up is just doing this daily show. And the rest of the day, I'm just tanked with other stuff, air, you know, just life, right? But I have to be okay with that. And I should be okay with that. Because as long as I'm moving towards a worthy goal that is totally doable, by the way, in the next 10 years, it will become realized. It will happen. And I promise you, and I promise you, and I hope this is encouraging for you guys today, 
I promise you that it will happen for you too. You have to just keep stepping. You have to keep moving. You have to keep going. Don't get depressed. Go and get down on yourself 1% every day. If you struggle with that tension like I do, leave a comment. Let me know. I'm here for you. I'm working. I'm going. I'm trying to create community, trying to learn about venture capital as fast as I can so I can build my own venture capital fund. And I'm so glad that some of you guys, not all of you, but I'm so glad that some of you guys are really rooting me on, cheering me on, and supporting me. It means all the world to me. Thanks, so guys. Thanks so much, guys, for being here. Thanks for allowing me to be part of your day Monday. And I hope you have a great day. I'll see you guys next time.